eternal God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us again and enabling us to lean on you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we come to hear from you through your word. We pray that you bless the word, Father God, that your word will instruct us, your word will lead us, the word will bless us. Lord, we ask you to bless us now that we will hear from you. Forgive us from our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will dictate that we have been with Jesus. So in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Thank God. so much for joining us tonight in our Bible study. We are excited about Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. In the New Testament, the book is Acts, the chapter is 9, and we will look at the first nine verses on tonight. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9 is where we are tonight. Thank God for another privilege. Let me tell you, God has been good to us. I think I'll repeat that two more times. God has been good to us. God has been good to us. And regardless of how you've been treated, God is good. Hallelujah to the Lord. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9 is where we are tonight. We've looked at Acts chapters 1 through 7. When we got to seven, we realized that, that Stephen was stoned to death because of Jesus. Jesus got Stephen in trouble. Isn't that something? Jesus not only got Stephen in trouble, he got, got Stephen murdered. Not only get, did he get Stephen murdered, he got Stephen stoned to death. Stephen stood up on that set day and he preached Jesus. He spoke about Jesus. He talked about Jesus. And just because he talked about Jesus, brother Miles, guess what happened? He died. My, my, my. It says something to us today. Sometimes you get in trouble for Jesus. But if you get in trouble for Jesus, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. If you get in trouble for Jesus, it's all right. So Stephen was stoned in there. Stephen was what? One of the first seven deacons. deacons, right? Stephen was one of the first seven deacons. He was not considered an apostle because of what? Why wasn't he an apostle? He was a deacon, but why wasn't he an apostle? Or was he an apostle? No, he wasn't. He was not? Why wasn't he an apostle? You have to walk with Jesus in order to be apostles. So you got a lot of people calling themselves apostles today. Amen. Everybody looking to you to answer their questions. Amen. Amen. So, so Stephen was not one of, among one of the apostles, but he was one of the first deacons. And remember, now the Jewish congregation is rising up against this thing called Christianity. When we look at chapter 7, Stephen is killed. We come out of chapter 7 into chapter 8. When we get to chapter 8, um, we realize that, let me make sure I got my numbers right here. We realize that, that Paul, Saul, Saul, he was not Paul, Saul is consenting to his death. He held the coats of those who killed Stephen. He held their coats. That means he was with them. He was consenting with them. He was saying, go on, man, do your thing. Even if he didn't open his mouth, he was consenting. Even if he didn't throw a stone, he was guilty. So Saul, 
is still breathing havoc. Still, the Bible calls it making havoc upon the church. Then we have a guy there called Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer was one who was a, a soothsayer. He was one who was a magician. He was one that had bewitched the people. He was a sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer saw all the acts of the apostles and he began to want some of that. What was some of that he wanted? What was that he wanted? He wanted some of that. What was it? The spirit that they had to be able to do miracles. He wanted some of the Holy Spirit. Sister Woods, he wanted the Holy Spirit so badly until what happened? He wanted to do what? To get some. Buy some. He wanted to buy some. Thank you, Sister Woods. Thank you so much. He wanted to buy some. He wanted to buy some of the Holy Ghost. Well, is the Holy Ghost for sale? Is the, is the Holy Ghost a it? The Holy Ghost is the divine third person of the Trinity. He is the divine one. He is the Holy Spirit. So he's not for sale. Then as, as the apostles tell him, you and your whole idea is going to go to hell. He got it right, didn't he? So Simon the Sorcerer got it right. The next pericope we run upon in chapter 8, we find... Philip. Philip is preaching or teaching the eunuch. The eunuch, which was the treasurer for Candace the queen, he's riding in a chariot. He's coming from church. The Bible says he's coming down from Jerusalem, coming from church. He's coming from church and he's reading the book of Isaiah. And when he's reading the book of Isaiah, he says that he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And before his shearer, he was silent. He opened not his mouth. He was very humble and he was humiliated. His justice was taken away. And who will declare, declare this generation or his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So he's reading, he's, he's reading the Bible. He's reading about Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit leads Philip to join the eunuch as he is reading. The Bible says the Spirit told him to rise up and go and join the chariot. He told him what city to go in, told him what area to go in, told him to go and join the chariot. He found the Ethiopian there. The Bible said he ran to him. He went near. He overtook the chariot. Whenever you are in a soul winning position, it is your responsibility to control the soul winning experience. Because remember, you are prepared. You are so prepared until you are ready, you are equipped, you are prepared. So the Bible said he obeyed the angel of the Lord. He obeyed the Holy Spirit. He ran to the chariot, took over the conversation. The question was asked, who is this author talking about? himself or some other man. As they discussed it, the eunuch discovers that he's talking about Jesus. The eunuch heart was pricked. His heart was pricked to receive Jesus Christ as his savior. When we get to verse 36 of Acts chapter eight, the eunuch asks the question. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, or asked, See, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Verse number 37 is not in some translation. Verse number 37 in the New King James Virgin says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. In other words, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We are to baptize when people believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Children not all of them should not be baptized because they want crackers and juice. Children ought not be baptized because their friends are baptized. 
Children not ought, to, ought not to be baptized because they feel heartburn in their chest. Children, men, women, boys, and girls should only be baptized when they know Jesus as the Son of God. The Son of God who died on Calvary. The Son of God who God raised from the dead. And trust that story to get them to heaven. That's the only time we ought to baptize anybody. Your money can't baptize, should not get you baptized. Matter of fact, the sorcerer just wanted to spend his money. That's all he wanted to do is pay some money. So he wanted to spend some money to be baptized, to, to receive the Holy Spirit. So you can't even spend money just to be baptized. Baptism is the outward showing of an inward grace. Baptism is an outward showing of what you believe on the inside. Bible says they went down into the water. What does that say to us? They went down into the water and they came back up out of the water. They did. What does that mean? Y'all see what she's saying? Y'all see? No? No, they can't see what she's saying. They went down, they came up symbolic of Jesus going down in the grave and rising from the Okay, so they went down into the water and it is symbolic to the fact that Jesus died on Calvary buried in a borrowed tomb and raised from the dead. So they have to understand, those who are to be baptized, must understand the fact that Jesus died, was buried, rose from the dead. They went down into the water. The Bible says they came back up out of the water. There was no sprinkling. There was no dashing of water. There was no slaying of water. They went down into the watery grave and they rose back as Jesus rose from the dead. That's the way we ought to baptize. After, Pete, after Philip finished his job, the Bible says he got caught up. This is the same word caught up that is found in Second, as First Thessalonians letter, chapter 4, verse 17. To be caught up. When the church is caught up and raptured away. One of these days we all who believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We going to be caught up. It's that it's the snatching away. It's the pulling away from this earth. We going to be caught up one day. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That those of us who believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We will be caught up one day. We will be with the Lord forever. And those of us who remain will be caught up after the dead has risen in Christ. So the Bible says that, that uh, there was some rejoicing going on. When someone come to Christ, there ought to be some rejoicing. There ought to be some, there ought to be some celebration. When men and women give their lives to Christ, we ought to celebrate. We ought to rejoice. We ought to be excited about it. We ought to rejoice in the Lord. He was caught up and he was found in another place. He was preaching in the cities till he came to Caesarea Philippi. Everywhere he went, he was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Still it was. But when we get to chapter 9, wherever there's a hill, there's a valley. Did y'all hear what I just said? Wherever there's a mountaintop, there is a valley. T.J. said it really well. He said that David would never have been the king. He never would have been known as he was known unless he got past the giant. In other words, you got to go past some giants in your life in order to be victorious for God. So you have to get past the giants. So when we look at chapter 9, there's a giant there. A giant. Saul is there. The first thing that the Acts writer says in chapter 9 is that then Saul, here he comes again. Remember, Saul was a young man when they killed Stephen, right? And so if you don't change a young man at an early age, he becomes an old man doing the same thing he did as a young man. 
So we got to get people saved. Regardless of who they are, they must be born again in order to be saved. Will someone stand and read real big the first few, first five verses and someone read the last four verses for me all the way to verse number nine and we'll, we'll call it tonight. When we look at chapter nine, verses one through nine, when we look at chapter nine, Saul is still breathing threatenings. He's still on his white horse. He's still riding. He's still killing folk. He's still pulling folk out the house. You can come here and read all of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 and it says then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way whether men or women he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3. And he journeyed, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Thank you. Thank you so much. So when we look at uh, chapter 9, we see it begins with Saul. Saul. Saul really got it going on, didn't he? He killing folk. He pulling them out the house. He asked for permission from the high priest to go and pull them out. See, in those days, you had to get permission from whatever the authority was at the time. And in biblical days, in the New Testament, we find that when someone is healed, they had to go to the priest and show themselves. In the Old Testament, they had to go to the priest and show themselves. That's why Jesus says, go to the synagogue, show yourself. So whoever is in authority, whether it's a governmental official or a high priest, you have to get permission to do things. The problem in the 21st century, brother, is that folk don't want permission in the church. They want to just walk in the church or participate in church and do whatever they want to do, say what they want to do, act any way they want to act and think that there is no one in authority that they need to address. And we talk about doing things decently and in order. And there's always those who want to do things decently in order that are not doing things decently and in order. So Papa Saul goes and he's still breathing threatenings, he's still murdering people, he's still fighting the disciples of Jesus Christ. He asks for a letter from the high priest to go into the synagogue to pull them out and if he find anyone in the way what do you think that means? Find anybody in the way of the way anybody that's trusting Jesus who's walking in the way anybody else? anybody in the way now is he talking about anybody that gets in his way? of the way of the way. There's a church that, that was open in, in, in Pearl Land called the Way Church. The reason why it's called the Way Church is because the implication is that the members of this church are of the way. They're in the way. They're of the way. They're in Jesus Christ. In other words, during these 
these times where Judaism was on the rise, he wanted to find anybody that was of the way. <laughs> of the way. It's like someone comes in this room today and says, okay, anybody that's Christians, come on out, we're going to kill you. How many of you no longer be Christians? I mean, instantly, I don't know Jesus. <laughs> Peter did it right. Peter says, I don't know him. Look, girl, say, oh yeah, he's the one that was with him. Girl, you better shut up. And then he starts speaking in tongues. He cussed this little girl flat out because they recognized that he was of the way. He was of the way. He was walking in the way. He was dealing with Christianity. So Saul would pull them out, bring them out. They, he pulled them out of Jerusalem. He would put them out of the synagogue. He would pull them right out of church. Now, were they bothering Saul? Yes? No? They went, he wasn't bothering, they weren't bothering him? No. Why are you doing it? It's mean and hateful. It's mean and hateful. Brother Miles, why are you doing it? He thought that they were an offense to God. They were not serving God the way God should properly be served. Okay, so that, that was his proper way of serving God. He, he wanted to make sure that people knew the proper way of serving God. It's crazy, somebody said. So, so there are individuals who believe that they are only the ones that are on the way, are in the way, are of the way. And they are just as adamant about it as Saul. There's a group of Israelites right now call themselves the black Israelites. Man, they are such a violent group of people. Even if I wanted to go their way, you can't scare me into that way. You can't make me go that way. So Saul was pulling people out. And guess what he did? He did it to men and women. Didn't care who you were. He brought them and he bound them and brought them to Jerusalem. He gonna make them worship Judaism. He's gonna make them worship the way they used to worship. He was stuck in tradition. It's like us being stuck in tradition. We stuck in our ways, but our ways are not of the way. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from where? Heaven. It's an indication that no man shined this light. God shined this light. This light came from heaven. I'm going to tell you, God got his attention. When God wants to get your attention, he's going to get your attention. Whether you want to give him your attention or not, God is going to get your attention when God wants to get your attention. The problem is, folk make God shine a light from heaven to get their attention. The problem is God has to knock them to the ground. Some commentaries say he was knocked from his beast. But as we read, we see that he was knocked to the ground. It doesn't matter whether he was knocked from his beast or knocked to the ground. God got his attention. Every day of our lives, God's trying to get our attention. Can he speak to you and get your attention? Or does he have to knock you to the ground to get your attention? Some people just got to hit rock bottom. I ain't going to do it until I until God gets my attention. I oftentimes tell the story of a brother who had a heart attack in, in the cardiologist's office on the treadmill. Had a heart attack. He's running on the treadmill and collapsed on the heart attack with a heart attack on the treadmill. Bam! Let me tell you, God was with him because the best place to have a heart attack is not just in the doctor's office, but the cardiologist's office. He dropped dead in the cardiologist's office. They revived him. So we began to talk to him about Jesus after he was revived, and after he had come home, after he had been home for two or three years. We talked to him about Jesus. You know what he said to me, my brother? I'm waiting on God to give me a sign. 
before I turn my life over to God. He said, I'm waiting on God to give me a sign before I turn my life over to God. God gave him 10 more years. And he came back and knocked again. And this time there was no one around to revive him. So David, you waiting on the sign? So as well as you waiting on the sign? Brother Miles, you waiting on the sign? You need a good sign? You need, need a real good one? I dare tell you, if you had a heart attack, if you dropped and you were dead, you got a sign. You may not call it a sign, you may not call it, but God has gotten your attention and he got your attention right then and there. And since he got your attention, you ought to give your life to him. Saul, journeying on the road near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Look at what, what Saul's reaction is. A voice speaking to Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What was Saul's re response? And he said, Who are you, Lord? You think you know who he is? Let me tell you, when, when God is getting somebody's attention, they already know who God is. They already know that it's God that's trying to get, because it's the same God that's been trying to get your attention all along, that you've been ignoring. So it says, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord made it very clear to him. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. I'm Jesus. I am the Son of God. I'm the same Son of God found in Acts chapter 8 when the eunuch came to know God. I'm that Son. I'm Jesus. It's amazing how, how a moment can change a whole setup in life. It's amazing how you can see the eunuch in Acts chapter 8 that have turned his life over to God willingly, without a sign, just the word of God. The word of God is such a great word until if we're going to give our lives to Christ, the word of God is sufficient to turn our lives to him. The word of God is sufficient. The problem is the word of God is not sufficient enough for most people. I dare say most people. The word of God is sufficient to you or you need other stuff. You need some drama in your life. <laughs> a lot of people need drama. They just they just got we just got to have a testimony. Let me tell you, meeting Jesus without going through trouble, without going through trauma, without going through grief ought to be enough. The eunuch tells us it's enough. Saul says. I'm going to continue to pull Christians out the house. I don't care if a man or a woman. I'm going to arrest them. I'm going to take them back to Jerusalem. And I am going to kill them if I have to. But they're going to make sure they're no longer of the way. So, God has to get his attention. He knocks him to the ground. Bright light shines from heaven knocks him to the ground. Conversation goes. Who are you, Lord? You ever ask a question that you already know the answer to? Most of the time, people ask questions they already know the answer to. They, they, they ask questions and, and they already know the answer. They just try to filibuster. Jesus answers him, though. Usually, Jesus would answer a question with a question, but this time when he dealt with Saul, he answered it with a statement. I am Jesus, 
whom you are crucified, you, you are persecuting. Some versions say crucifying. You are prosecuting, you're persecuting me. You are you are the one who is kicking against, King James says, kicking against the prick. New King James says hard for you to kick against the goals. Kicking against the goal is one, it is one phrase, meaning that the work that you're doing is, is in vain. The work that you're doing will never get you anywhere. Kicking against the goals means that whatever you're doing is not going to get you success. You're like that hamster on a wheel, just running, you're just running, you, and you see somebody walk off, you take off running again, you're going nowhere on that wheel but in circles. Who was it, Brother Miles, that say, way to go around in circles? Billy Preston. That's who? Billy Preston. Billy Preston said. <laughs> Brother Miles trying to educate Sister Davis tonight. Way to go around. You just going around in the circles. You just going around. And then another songwriter says, don't go chasing waterfalls. You never catch those waterfalls. You're kicking against the goal, Saul. You will never have victory here. You're fighting a losing battle. You're just annoying other people. You're provoking people. But you never will have success. You're just kicking against the prick. You will never get anywhere the way you're going. There are people who live their lives doing the same thing all their lives and they never ever get anywhere doing the same things. And then when they change from one thing to the other, they change and get worse and worse. Until a man, woman, boy, and girl does it God's way, you're going to always be kicking against the prick. Unless you do it the way the Word says it, unless you do it the way God says it, you will never ever, ever get in the way. Two step forward, one step back. Two step forward, two step back. One, two step forward, three step back. You will find yourself worse off next year than you were this year, unless you do it God's way. And if you're going to do it God's way, you got to do it according to God's word. Verse number six. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I, I've been telling you all week long, all month long, all year long, all 19 years long. When God calls you to do something, he's not always calling you to preach. He, he's calling you to get your life right. And if God calls you to get your life right, he has a ministry for you to do. God doesn't have any pew members. God has something for us to do. Saul was sharp enough. Of course, he's educated. He's smart. He knows the word according to Judaism. He knows everything about his religion, but he doesn't know Christianity. That's how we are today. We know our religion. We know we know our creeds. We we know our handbooks, but we need to know Jesus. If we know the handbook, if we know Hobbes book, if we know the the black book, if we know the book on what ministers should do. If we don't know the word of God, we're not getting anywhere. We're kicking against the prick. And you will not be victorious unless you walk with Jesus and what he says in his book. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Arise, get up from where you are. I know you're on the ground. I know I knocked you to the ground. Now get up, that reminds me back home. They whoop you so long, they said, shut up that crying before I give you something to cry about. 
I'm, I'm wondering what was the last 20 minutes all about. <laughs> and then if you get down, they say get up. If you get up, they say sit down. I remember that day, mama says, mama said, oh, you, you ain't gonna cry, huh? Start crying. Then she said, oh, cut up that, shut up that cry before I give you something to cry about. I'm like, and then you can't even sniff. Stop, cut it out. I told you, cut it out. And then if you start talking, Brother Miles, you never had one of those kind of things. If you start talking and you say, I'm not going to do it anymore, then they make a song out of it. I know you're not going to do it anymore. That's what Saul is up against. Jesus said, get up from there. He says, get up, arise, go into the city, and when you get there, you'll be told what to do. Now, that would have missed a bunch of us right there. Many of us has to have the name, address, the email, the Twitter. We got to have the zip code. We have to have the person we're going to find. We get, we're not going to leave until you tell me where I'm going. But that's what faith is all about. When you operate in faith, you don't have all the information. You just got to go. Jesus says, our Lord says, go and you'll be told what you must do. How many people live their lives like that by faith? I am going and God is going to tell me what to do. When we hear a person talking like that, we think they're crazy. We were walking to Seawall in Galveston. One guy passed by us and he was like, you know, I'm a Christian and, and I, we, were, we were riding bikes. We had signs on the, on the back, of, back of our bikes and, and he said, hey, y'all, cycling ministry, right? Yeah, we're cycling ministry. He said, man, look, I, I love the Lord and I go anywhere he tells me to go. I'm from, I'm from I'm San Diego, California, and I'm here in Galveston, Texas. And he was talking about the Lord. He didn't even ask for money he was talking about the Lord. He didn't beg for anything. He was talking about the Lord. Most of the people like that, we call them crazy. But when we see Saul, Jesus says, just, just arise, go where you need to, where you go. When you get to the city, they'll tell you what you need to do. Isn't that something? In verse number seven, it, decides, it describes the atmosphere. It says, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. The men who went with him, they were speechless. Hearing a voice but not seeing anyone. Hearing a voice but seeing no one. Hearing a voice but didn't visualize anybody. Didn't put their eyes on anybody. They heard a voice. I want to say to you today, when God's trying to get somebody's attention around you, you don't need to hear and you don't need to see. You may hear. One, 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 one theologian says they heard it, but they didn't understand it. Because the Lord wasn't talking to them. Sometimes you're just there so you can see what the Lord, the Lord is doing and not necessarily seeing what, and hearing what the Lord is, he is saying. The testimony is the fact that God is doing some things and he's doing it to Saul, not doing it to you. Go to the city. You will be told what you must do. The men are speechless. They hear in a voice but seeing no one. Verse 8. Then Saul arose. Why did Saul arose? Because Jesus said, get up. Then Saul arose from the ground. Why did Saul have to get up from the ground? Because he had fallen to the ground. I want to tell you, heaven has a way of knocking you to the ground. My, my, my. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. Now here Saul is, blinded. Having a whole conversation. Talking to the Lord. Sometimes God has to get our physical attention in order to deal with our spiritual lives. 
God wants your spiritual attention. But sometimes he has to create a defect in our physical bodies in order to get our spiritual attention. Isn't that something? I want to tell the Lord, you don't have to break my leg to get my attention. You ain't got to knock me down to get my attention. Speak, Lord, speak. The Bible says he told him to get up. He got up. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. How many of you can have a conversation? You know something just went wrong, something that's out of the ordinary just happened to you. You're having a full conversation. You know who the person is. You say who the person is. You're having a full conversation, and in the midst of this conversation, you still, you still going to get up and do what he said to do. There'll be some stubborn people. Matter of fact, before this moment, Saul was stubborn. Before this incident, Saul was, Saul was doing his own thing. But after this moment, Saul was obedient unto God. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. That's why we call it the road to Damascus. He was on his way to Damascus. We call it the road to Damascus. When you mention the road to Damascus, people automatically know that we're talking about the, the story of Saul. He was blinded on that road. He was knocked to the ground on that road. God got his attention on that road. That's why when you read 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 15, Saul says that I am an apostle out of due season. He means I saw the Lord on the road. I am the last of the apostles. I'm an apostle out of due season. I'm an apostle when apostleship had gone out of style. I'm going out of business. So, Brother Miles, why we got so many apostles? Self-titled. Self-titled apostles? Are you an apostle, Brother Miles? Uh, no, sir. And we got a lot of apostolettes. <laughs> so I says, I'm an apostle out of due season. I came to be an apostle simply because Jesus dealt with me on the Damascus road. And the text says he didn't even see him. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Verse number nine. And he was three days. How long? Three days. How long was it? Three days. He was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. He was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. We talk about fasting. The, the text doesn't say that he was fasting, but let's talk about the fact that when we fast, we want to hear from the Lord. If Saul wasn't fasting, it was a good time to fast. He was three days without sight. He was three days without food. He was three days without drink. He had heard from the Lord. Jesus met him on the Damascus road. He's different. I guarantee you, after verse number nine in Acts chapter nine, Saul is different. When you meet Jesus on your own road, you got to turn out differently. When a man, woman, boy, girl meet Jesus, they can never be the same. I question whether some people have met Jesus. 
Because when you meet Jesus, things are different. Anybody in this room different since they met Jesus? I mean, you were already good. You didn't rob, steal, kill. You didn't prostitute. But are you different since you met Jesus? The Bible says that when Saul met Jesus, he was different. Sometimes God has to knock us to the ground to get our attention. Sometimes God has to blind us to get our attention. Sometimes God has to have us blind for even three days. Three days are significant. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How long? Three days. Saul was blind. How long? Three days. Jesus was in the belly of the earth. How long? Three days. And because of those three days, now even more than 2,100 years later, more than 2,100 years later, more than 2,000 years later, we still are talking about these three days being significant to Jesus. And because it's significant to Jesus, it's significant to us. Jesus died on Calvary. They laid Jesus in the earth for three days. It's, it's significant because Jesus stayed in the grave for three days and then he got up just like he said he would. You destroy this temple and three days I'll raise it up again. He was dead for three days. That's why the preacher gets so excited because that three days only lasted three days. And early that third day morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He died. He was buried. And in three days, he rose from the dead. It's significant because it takes those three things to get to know Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You must trust this three-day story. The fact that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose from the dead. Stayed in the earth for three days. And after those three days, he rose quickly. Early in the morning, he rose from the dead. And because Jesus got up, we can get up. Because Jesus lived, we can live. Because Jesus lived, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. The door is open. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment to get to know Him. Just believe the three-day story that's over 2,000 years old. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, that He was buried in a borrowed tomb, stayed there for three days, and early that third day morning, He rose from the dead. He rose for you and he rose for me. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity to get to know him. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. 
Amen and thank God. We believe if you pray this prayer honestly believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead, that he's coming to your life, we believe that you're saved right now, right here where you are. If you're looking for a good Bible teaching church, I believe that you should come and join the New Beginning Church. New Beginning Church, Southeast Houston, Texas, 4251 Shiremont Road, Houston, Texas. That's Shiremont Road, S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. -E come and be a part of the Bible teaching church. That's 4251 Shiremont Road, Houston, Texas, 774, 77048, 77048. Thank you for joining us tonight for Bible study. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please come and join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study for Sunday school, rather, and 10.30 a.m. for our worship service here at the New Beginning Church. You can join us live or in person. We'd like to have you in person. Please come and be a part of our service. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. You can give by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77. 459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of giving. We ask you to bless every gift and bless every giver. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Any praise reports? Prayer requests. Any anything we've been praying for and God has delivered. I want to thank God for his safe, rewarding, and successful summer enrichment camp with more than 30-some children. I thank God for a safe, rewarding, and successful summer enrichment camp where young people were able to to be blessed and we were able to see them blossom and bloom. I want to thank our sister Ruby Poss for joining us by way of Zoom. Thank you so much for being a part of our service on tonight. And all of those on, on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for being a part. We enjoyed having you with us tonight. Uh, please feel free to come by and visit with us. We'll be glad to that you visit with us and we'll be glad to have you. Amen. Why don't we stand to be this message? Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord, that you know how to get our attention. God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us that you can get our attention through your word. We thank you for speaking to us, for blessing us and keeping us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us to always look to Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will be made the better through your word. Bless our church, that our church, Father God, will continue to reach souls to you, that men, women, boys, and girls will be made of you. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless Turning Hearts and Industries and all their outreaches and all that they do. We ask you to continue to walk with them. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us, Father God, that we will get excited about winning souls for Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, your word says that we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send labors into the field. We come now praying for the vineyard. We know the fruit is right. We pray, Father God, that you grant us harvesters. Harvesters that will pick the fruit that is right. Bless us, Father God, that we will be overpoured with blessings that we will reach souls for you, that workers will come and join us, that you will bring, Father God, with a heart turned toward ministry, 
with hearts turned toward you. Bless us, Father God, that we will see your master, that your way is easy and your burden is light. Bless our hearts, Father God, that we will be focused on you, that a watching world will see us and glorify your holy name. And Lord, we ask you to keep all the glory, keep all the dominion, and Lord, I ask you to bless us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. God bless you.